Good morning, everyone. We are letting all the registrants into the Zoom, so we will get started here shortly. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying their sunny fall Monday. Ready again, good morning. Uh, we are letting a few more reg registrants in. We will um, start promptly here at 10 o'clock, which is just in about a minute here. All right, well, by my clock, it's 10 o'clock. So um, welcome again and good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Darling and I'm the manager of membership and annual giving here at your Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And welcome to this latest edition of our members only virtual program, Curator Conversations. Uh, this month we are joined by Dr. Uh, Karen Cherry, who is our senior curator here at the museum. And she's going to be discussing um, a very timely subject, reconsidering Columbus in Richmond, um, as I'm sure many of you all know, and maybe some of you are even enjoying the day off. Um, this is now Indigenous Peoples Day, a federal holiday, used to be uh, Columbus Day. So Karen's gonna talk about the history of Columbus um, in Richmond. And um, before I hand it over to Karen, I did wanna, of course, let you know, as always, that if you have questions throughout the program, please add them to the Q&A function or to the chat. If you have any technical issues throughout the program, add those to the chat and um, we will do our best to assist you with that. And lastly, a bit of housekeeping, we now have on our Zoom programs, the ability to see the live transcript of the program. Uh, so much like if you're watching the news, there's a ticker tape that gives you the um, subtitles. So you can turn that on, on your Zoom recording in the um, lower panel next to the share screen, raise hand record. Again, if you have any issues or, or you wanna find where that is, add that to the chat. And I believe that that's all of the housekeeping. So again, welcome. And I will pass it off to Dr. Karen Sherry. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, uh, our members, for, for joining this program on what has, as Elizabeth intimated, traditionally been celebrated as Columbus Day, but now many communities across the country here in Richmond, across Virginia, and um, the country also acknowledge it as Indigenous Peoples Day. And that very change is rooted in um, uh, a new ways of thinking about Columbus's legacy, which I am going to address in this talk. Um, but first, let's start with the local. As uh, those of you living here in Richmond know, over the past few years, Virginia's monumental landscape has changed dramatically. Um, in the wake of the police murder of George Floyd, May of 2020, and the groundswell of social justice protests that followed, uh, we saw our community in Richmond, many communities across the country, um, take down their Confederate monuments, sometimes officially, sometimes non-officially. Uh, they removed monuments that um, were considered to be symbols of white supremacy and racial oppression. Um, uh, they were considered con symbols in the state it, in the sake of uh, Confederate monuments, symbols of the lost cause ideology, um, uh, various ideologies and values that no longer seem consistent with um, American ideals of equity. 
Um, a similar fate befell the Columbus Monument here in Richmond, um, a monument that had been installed in Bird Park in front of the reservoir um, in 1927. And it was removed during that summer of social justice protests and monument removals, it was removed on June 9th. Um, there was a protest of people who were there to demonstrate for the rights of indigenous peoples as part of a larger wave of um, calls for justice and equity, particularly for people of color. This was a protest specifically highlighting um, uh, the indigenous community and protesters tagged the statue with graffiti, held signs um, such as the one you see in the middle image, Columbus represents genocide. And ultimately they tore um, uh, the statue off its base and dragged it into the nearby Fountain Lake. And in the lower right, you can see um, uh, Columbus um, kind of drowning in the pool, if you will. Um, the, the city then removed the statue um, and it remains in, in city storage. So no longer in its original location on a pedestal in front of the reservoir in Bird Park. Uh, now, um, Richmond was not alone in removing its Columbus monuments as part of, as I say, this um, wave of recognition of indigenous rights and the problematic significance of Columbus with regard to indigenous people. Columbus statues across the country suffered various forms of damage or removal. And I'm just showing two examples on the left. Um, the Columbus statue in Boston had its head knocked off. Um, and in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, Minnesota State Capitol, um, their Columbus statue was also torn down. Um, so as we look about the look at the evolution of Columbus's legacy, let's just take a moment to remind ourselves of Columbus. He is like some historical figures um, has become kind of a mythic figure. So sometimes it takes a little time to um, peel back all of those layers of legend and mythology um, and remind ourselves of the, the history um, uh, of the actual person. Um, Columbus, uh, he was, um, oh, I realize I made a typo in his birth date. That should be, a, um, excuse me, 1461. <laughs> um, apologize for that. Uh, he was um, born in Genoa in Italy. He was a mariner and a navigator. Um, uh, as an experienced seaman, he was very keen to find a westward route to Asia to um, particularly China and India for very valuable commodities of spices. Um, and he went to uh, several royal houses seeking support for an expedition to find that westward route across the Atlantic and instead of having to go around Africa and eastward through the Indian Ocean to Asia, Columbus was hoping to find a westward route across the Atlantic. He finally won support from um, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. And uh, in 1492, um, he embarked across the Atlantic and uh, in October 1492 landed in what is today the Bahamas. Uh, that was the first of a total of four voyages Columbus made to the Americas. Um, on his voyages, he explored the region, he explored what we now know of as the Caribbean, parts of Central and South America. Um, he also um, established settlements um, and um, those settlements led to the enslavement, oppression and, and death of many of the indigenous inhabitants of those places. Um, nevertheless, um, his, his voyage of uh, a European discovering, um, and, I, and I put that in quotes, discovering a new world, what was to Europeans a new world, uh, really had a monumental impact on um, uh, European culture. It was the, um, uh, it opened up the way of 
European exploration and colonization of the Americas, it also led to an oftentimes violent clash between European cultures, um, those colonizers, and the indigenous people of, of the lands they settled. Um, uh, so very early on in 1493, Columbus was um, uh, credited as the discoverer of a new world, um, a, a legacy that um, uh, stuck with him for several centuries. Uh, after Columbus's death in 1506, um, and in the um, 1600s uh, through the 1800s, um, as uh, historians started to write about the exploration of the Americas um, and Columbus's life, those historical accounts were generally very sympathetic uh, to Columbus. He was hailed as a visionary um, uh, figure who um, uh, doggedly um, persevered um, uh, in the face of um, challenges such as finding financial support for his voyages, challenges such as various mutinies from his men and some of the other Spanish settlers. Um, at one point, um, uh, Columbus was imprisoned by uh, some of the administrators in the Spanish settlements in the Caribbean and got sent back to Spain in chains. Um, uh, he died ill and fighting for the fortune he thought he was owed um, under the terms of the voyages he made. So, but despite all of those difficulties, the histories of Columbus generally prayed him, uh, praised him as this visionary, courageous explorer. explorer. Um, they also praised the evangelical element of, um, of uh, European um, colonization. They saw Columbus as a figure who was doing God's work by bringing Christianity to the so-called savages or, or pagans of the Americas. Um, as I say, he did face many challenges and difficulties. So these histories also painted him as kind of like a martyr who was misunderstood uh, and mistreated. Now, um, even though uh, shortly after um, uh, Columbus's time in the Caribbean, um, the atrocities committed against the indigenous people became well known, um, not just through Columbus's own reports, but a little later on in this in the 1620s um, and and excuse me, the 1520s and on through the writings of um, of de las Casas, a man who was a, um, uh, he began as a Spanish settler, but then um, became um, uh, horrified by what he saw in the treatment of the indigenous tribes of the Caribbean, and he became a major advocate for them, um, later converted to become a Dominican monk. Um, de las Casas wrote about the atrocities uh, that the Spanish settlers were committing against the Native Americans. And even though many of those atrocities began under Columbus's rule, um, uh, Columbus as a historical figure was um, generally distanced from what became known as the black legend. Um, uh, that is until um, the 1970s when historians began to take a much more critical view of Columb Columbus. And um, that's when you also see the language and historical scholarship saying from um, changing from describing Columbus as a discoverer of the new world um, he didn't discover it. Um, it was already inhabited by indigenous peoples. Rather, he was described as a despoiler of um, the New World because his voyage, which brought Europeans to the New World, led to a widespread indigenous genocide, also opened up um, uh, the door for the development of the transatlantic slave trade. So um, as you can see over the centuries, Columbus's legacy um, uh, has, has shifted from one of being exclusively heroic to one that is much more problematic and, and complex and, and fraught with um, uh, the, the death and destruction that European colonization brought upon the indigenous inhabitants of the American, of the Americas. 
now in um, uh, what would become the United States, um, Columbus wasn't really a well-known figure um, among the general population until the revolutionary period. Um, just before the revolution, we start to see poets, um, civic leaders, and others start to talk about Columbus as a distinctly American hero. And um, there was a reason for this because um, uh, the patriots who were seeking independence from Britain were looking for a um, distinct tradition, a distinct pantheon of heroes that were separate from Britain. And we can see this, for example, in the development of a unique national personification for America, one that took on the name of Columbia. Um, as a British colony, um, uh, American colonials were, uh, American colonists, excuse me, were represented by Britannia, the uh, long-standing personification of Britain. Well, during the revolutionary period, we start to see artists, um, poets, and so forth, um, promote a distinct personification called Columbia. And um, we can see this personification appearing in political prints, um, uh, including the example I have up on the screen where you see Britannia in the lower corner at left and um, this new American personification um, as a um, uh, Columbia at right. And you can see how this artist is very strategically drawing on traditional artistic representations of Britannia, but giving her the attributes of, uh, of America, of um, colony that was seeking its independence personification that would also be known as Columbia after Columbus. Um, uh, we see, as I mentioned, poets um, talking about Columbus or Columbia, um, one, of, one of the, not the earliest, but one of the earliest appearances of Columbia in American poetry is by um, uh, the Black poetess Phyllis Wheatley, who in writing an ode to um, George Washington in 1775, she began her verse as follows. Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. So she's talking, she's personifying um, uh, the unified colonies, uh, what would become America, the United States of America as Columbia. Um, and again, you can see how artists have adapted Britannia as Columbia in the image at right. Now, as America gained its independence and was establishing itself as an independent nation, we start to see um, uh, Columbus appear uh, regularly, not just in um, uh, ep the epic poetry of Joe Barlow um, and other writers talking about America and its history. Um, we see it in um, the song Hail Columbia, which was adapted from um, President George Washington's um, uh, inaugural music. Um, we also see Columbus's name being used to name cities and towns and schools and um, indeed the nation's capital, the District of Columbia. So we really start to see Americans claiming Columbus, the um, Italian explorer working for the Spanish crown, who was the first European to land in the Americas. Um, the new young United States was claiming him as a national hero, in part to distinguish themselves from British history, from a Brit British uh, pantheon of heroes and a British legacy. Um, and um, again, very early on in the nation's history, um, 1792, which marked the 300th anniversary of Columbus's initial voyage. Um, that was when Columbus Day was uh, first celebrated in, in the nation. It wasn't necessarily called so, and it wasn't made a national holiday. That didn't happen until the um, uh, 20th century. But we see towns um, uh, throughout the young United States celebrate um, that anniversary of Columbus's first voyage through parades in which personifications of Columbus and also Columbia marched. Um, there were odes and toasts and so forth in New York and Boston, here in Richmond and other cities. 
Baltimore also erected the first monument to Columbus in the form of the obelisk you see on um, the screen at left. So um, from this uh, revolutionary and early national period in America, we see Columbus become a national American hero. He was seen um, and lauded as a symbol of American progress and uh, particularly the progress of American civilization. Um, throughout um, America's history, there's been a long tradition of envisioning America as this kind of new Jerusalem where um, uh, Western culture and um, excellence and civilizing pursuits traveled westward from Europe to this new country where it found its um, fullest and most perfect expression. And Columbus, Columbus's voyage and his legacy very much played into that national mythos of American progress and um, American civilization. Um, and Columbus uh, as a historical legend was seen as an, as an embodiment of those ideals. Um, so he continued to be celebrated as a national hero throughout the 19th century. Um, I'm just showing a couple examples in this um, print on the left, Family Monument to the History of Our Country, um, which includes scenes from the Revolutionary War, from westward expansion across the continent, row of the first um, uh, presidents. Um, at the top screen, you'll see in lower left, Columbus embarking um, uh, in the Americas um, takes kind of a prominent place. Um, similarly, we see Columbus at the top of a column of American heroes uh, in the image at right. Um, uh, those heroes include Washington, Franklin, um, Jefferson, Adams, and the Marquis de Lafayette. Columbus is right up at the top as kind of the first American hero. Um, and we see this perhaps most um, emphatically and uh, most importantly in the U.S. Capitol, um, in the decorations schemes, uh, decoration scheme of the U.S. Capitol that um, uh, really ramped up in the 1840s, uh, we see Columbus appearing multiple times at the U.S. Cap Capitol. These are just two, two of many examples of Columbus's appearance in the decor decorative program of the People's House, of the Nation's House, of the U.S. Capitol. Um, uh, these two examples include monumental painting. This painting is about four feet high and eight feet wide, showing the landing of Columbus. This appears in the U.S. Rotunda. It's one of eight scenes um, in that area. And then also at the east entrance of the U.S. Capitol, Columbus's life and story is the subject of this very elaborate um, a bronze door um, that's decorated with um, relief scenes from Columbus's life and story. So um, Columbus's presence, um, a repetitive presence at the U.S. Capitol underscores the um, importance he had in the pantheon of American symbols and American history. Uh, and this perhaps culminated uh, in 1892 at the 400th anniversary celebration of Columbus's first voyage in the form of the World's Columbian Exposition. Um, we don't really have uh, world expos um, in the way that existed in the 19th and through I'd say the mid 20th century, but this was a major world's fair. It was held in Chicago and it was named for Columbus. It was called the World's Columbian Exposition. And uh, millions and millions of people came to visit what was this huge complex full of displays showcasing American cultural excellence and also technological advances. It was, it was a major source of um, uh, national marketing and also national pride. And of course, the whole fair was named after Columbus and a lot of the um, uh, souvenirs and language around the world's Columbian Expo um, celebrated um, uh, Columbus as this uh, embodiment of the American spirit of progress and excellence. 
Um, and just to give a couple examples, um, uh, one um, writer um, penned a verse to Columbus reading, thou, thou searcher of the ocean, thee to sing, shall my devoted lyre awake each string. Columbus, hero, would my song could tell how great thy worth no praise can overswell the grandeur of thy deeds. Um, and similarly, um, in um, uh, celebrating Columbus and his feats, um, President Harrison designated October 21st of that year um, as a general holiday and called Columbus a pioneer of progress and enlightenment. And in addition to the um, World's Fair uh, celebration, months long, fair in Columbus, or excuse me, in Chicago, many other cities um, celebrated uh, Columbus with parades and so forth. Now at the same time in the, the late 19th century, um, uh, America was also undergoing a period of massive immigration and uh, we see the rise of um, intense anti-immigrant and nativist sentiments, um, many of which were directed against Italian immigrants, others from Southern and Eastern Europe who were making up the bulk of um, this mass immigration from um, the late 18th, excuse me, late 19th century and early 20th century. And in these years from the, from 1880 to 1920, about 4 million immigrants flooded into the United States, much to the consternation of many who felt that these immigrants um, were not um, sufficiently white, uh, did not represent Americans Anglo-Saxon Protestant value, uh, values. Um, most of these immigrants coming from places like Italy um, uh, uh, were um, non-Protestant, they were either Catholic or Jewish. Uh, so that was a source of some of the um, uh, prejudice against them. Um, and you can see the uh, some of the um, vitriol uh, of these nativist anti-immigrant sentiments expressed in this cartoon um, uh, from 1903 titled The High Tide of Immigration, A National Menace. Um, and you can see, um, you know, Uncle Sam, the the new uh, a kind of newer personification of America, clutching to this cliffside, um, representing American ideas and institutions, and he's being buffeted by these waves, a riffraff of immigration, as they're called in the cartoon. And if you look at the detail at the lower lower right, you'll see you know the heads representing these um, immigrants are described as criminals and degenerates and members of the mafia and anarchists and so forth. And um, those were the kinds of um, uh, ethnic slurs um, that were frequently lobbed against Italians, um, Italians who were considered not entirely white. They were darker skinned, they had um, a darker hair, um, uh, their proximity to Africa made many of these nativists feel that they weren't sufficiently Caucasian or white. Instead, they were more, um, uh, they were closer to Black Africans or they were considered using the terms of the period, mongrels. Um, and so there was a lot of specifically anti-Italian sentiments. Um, uh, they were called, you know, as I mentioned, criminals, members of the mafia, brigands, they were considered dirty and anarchists and so forth. They were often called um, various versions of, of the N-word. They were called white ends. I'm, I'm not gonna say that word. Um, that, that gives you a sense of the kind of uh, racist dimension of anti-immigrant, anti-Italian, specifically anti-Italian sentiments. And just a few examples um, from this period of American history that, that underscores the ethnic discrimination and prejudice uh, that Italian faced. Um, in 1891, this is probably the most horrific example, a group of it 11 Italians uh, were lynched by a mob in New Orleans. They were part of a group of people who had been um, arrested under false claims um, uh, for the killing of the police chief. 
And before they could get a fair trial, a lynch mob broke them out of prison and killed 11 of them. Uh, that was in 1891, the very year before the World's Columbian Expo. Uh, in 1912, um, a committee of the U.S. House of Representatives debated whether Italians could be considered sufficiently Caucasian or whether they should be classified as another racial group. Um, uh, a lot of these anti-immigrant sentiments culminated in 1924 when Congress passed the Immigration Act, which um, enacted uh, strict limits on immigration. And um, it, uh, it established a quota system for limiting the number of immigrants from, um, based on national origin. It excluded all Asians, um, uh, immigrants from Asian countries. It also placed strict limits on uh, immigrants from Italy, um, from various uh, Slovak countries and others who were the subject of the most vitriolic nativist sentiments in these years. Um, this is also a period that saw the rise of various nativist white supremacist groups like the Anglo-Saxon Clubs of America um, and um, uh, uh, increased membership in the Ku Klux Klan, and other white supremacist groups. And I'm just giving you an example of a quote from Ernest Cox, who was a leading um, proponent of uh, these um, nativist and anti-immigrant um, ideas through the pseudoscience of eugenics, um, a, a false science that believed that certain races were physically inferior to the white race. And of course, Italians, um, African-Americans and other non-white groups, those considered non-white groups were um, considered genetically inferior to whites. And you can get the sense of the sort of alarmist language of some of this eugenicist literature and this quote I include by Ernest Cox. We have in our midst increasing millions of a culturally inferior race in the presence of which white man's civilization has never survived. South and Southeastern Europeans are deluging our nation. Negroid Sicily is being transplanted to America. So in the face of this kind of um, uh, intense and very racist anti-immigrant sentiments, um, we see the Italian communities mobilizing to try to combat it. In 1882, the Knights of Columbus was founded as a fraternal organization for Catholic men, um, calling themselves after that national hero. Um, this group included not just Italians, but since many Italians uh, were Catholic, um, uh, a large number of Catholic men joined this organization, which had chapters across the country, including in Virginia. Um, similarly, in 1905, the Order of the Sons of Italy was established as a um, uh, beneficent organization for Italian immigrant communities. Um, and these organizations, they... Um, uh, they publish magazines and newspapers, you know, kind of the equivalent of community newsletters. They participated in parades. Um, they also supported monuments to Columbus. And we see an example of that um, in the photograph on the screen, which um, uh, takes place uh, took place in Washington, D.C. in 1912. This is a parade um, of float, including a float showing Columbus before the king. That was part of the unveiling ceremony of the Columbus Monument that the Knights of Columbus helped to erect in Washington, D.C. in front of the Union train station in D.C. Here in Richmond, we see a, um, uh, members of the Italian-American community in Richmond, um, including many members of these types of organizations. Um, in 1924, Five, they began an effort to um, erect a statue to Columbus here in Richmond. They started fundraising among their community, ended up raising $25,000. Um, and they wanted to erect a statue to express their love and appreciation for the city that they made their home for Richmond. Um, this turned into a bit of a 
controversy that gained national attention because when um, uh, the Italian community presented their proposal to the city council, um, the committee that considered those kinds of proposals, it rejected the proposal, as well as its proposed site on Monument Avenue after a petition was read at this council meeting. Um, uh, one of the aldermen, the city alderman, who was a member of the committee, he said that uh, he didn't want to see the Columbus statue in its original proposed location on Monument Avenue because that section of Monument Avenue should be reserved for generals of the Confederacy and the South. Um, there was no way this alderman wanted to see the statue to a Catholic Italian foreigner going on Monument Avenue, which was um, uh, devoted to white Southerners, greatest heroes of the Confederacy. Um, shortly after that May 28th meeting, it was learned that the um, citizens who signed that petition opposing the sculpture were members of the Patriotic Welfare Society, which was a um, anti-immigrant nativist group, members of the Ku Klux Klan and other similar organizations. And that really created a, um, not just a local controversy, but a controversy that was picked up across the nation. Um, it kind of became a bit of a, um, a, a black eye for Richmond. And um, uh, one of the cartoons that, it originally ran in the New York world, um, but it was also picked up by the Richmond News Leader, a local paper, um, in an article detailing uh, the identity of the members of the opponents to the Columbus statue. Um, that article was accompanied by a cartoon titled Christopher K. Columbus, all spelled in K's um, for the KKK underscoring who was opposed to this monument and shows various um, uh, uh, elements of the debate. Um, I find particularly interesting the two lower registers, uh, lower left, you see a group of hooded Klansmen pulling down a statue to Alexander Hamilton, um, founding era hero because he was born in the West Indies, so he was not considered 100% American by members of the KKK. Um, somewhat ironically, the frame at lower right um, shows um, a statue to Native American as um, the only 100% American. Ernest Cox and other white supremacists and eugenicists wouldn't have necessarily agreed with that, but this cartoon is pointing out the kind of um, uh, uh, inherent contradictions of, of these debates, um, uh, not wanting to include Columbus as an American worthy of memorialization through monuments. Um, at a later meeting of the city council, June 8th, um, the council approved uh, the erection of the statue, um, but they designated a location at the end of what was then called the Boulevard, today Arthur Ashe Boulevard, next to the Bird Park Reservoir. It's interesting to note that in that period in 1925, that was a really remote, out of the way part of Richmond. It was not a very developed area. So it was kind of um, uh, the city council begrudgingly giving the Italian community their statue, but making sure it was kind of in the um, in the outskirts of town. Uh, so the statue was finally erected in um, on December 9th, 1927, um, amidst a certain amount of fanfare. Virginia's governor, Harry Byrd, was there. The Italian consul to the United States came down from DC for the day. Um, here are uh, some photographs. Um, from the unveiling at the left, you can see, um, you know, all the, the big wigs on the stage surrounded by crowds that um, newspapers estimated about 2000 people, um, including many members of Knights of the Columbus and those other Italian fraternal organizations. You can see the statue draped in the Italian and American flag and as part of the unveiling those flags were um, uh, pulled off the statue to unveil the Columbus statue. And um, uh, part of the reason for the timeliness of today's talk, not just because it's a day traditionally considered Columbus Day, but also because um, the VMHC uh, was recently gifted the American flag that was used at this unveiling ceremony. So the very flag you see in these historic photographs 
is now here as part of the VMHC's collection. Um, and in the photograph, you see two young women, um, uh, Italian-American women who were part of the unveiling ceremony. They're shown draped in the flag. Uh, the woman at right is Anna Guarino. Um, she was the daughter of um, one of the men who, who participated in the efforts to erect this statue, and um, she helped participate in the unveiling. And um, for the Italian community, um, uh, Christopher Columbus was a major source of ethnic pride in the face of the um, uh, anti-immigrant um, and ethnic slurs that were hurled at them. Um, the uh, members of the Italian community embraced Columbus as an American hero. It was a way for them to claim their own belonging in America and to combat the, um, uh, the, the racist and ethnic slurs um, against them um, by um, a, a aligning themselves with this national hero who himself uh, was Italian in origin. Um, so, um, in part out of that kind of sense of pride um, in her ethnic heritage, Anna Guarino kept this flag throughout her life, um, and her family uh, very generously recently donated it to the VMHC as a really important document of um, uh, that Columbus statue and its complex history, both its history getting erected and its more recent history. Um, here's just another photograph. Our great collections team and photographer um, were able to sort of pose the um, flag around a mannequin, um, trying to recreate this historic photograph of Anna Guarino um, with the flag after the statue's unveiling. Um, as I mentioned, Columbus um, uh, was claimed at, by the Italian community in the late 19th and early 20th century as a way for them to um, claim uh, a place in American society as a source of community pride for them. And Columbus continued to have that role and, and um, for many Italian Americans uh, continues to have that role to the present day. Uh, the Columbus statue in Richmond was the site of regular Columbus Day celebrations um, led by um, the Order of the Sons of Italy, the Knights of Columbus, and other um, Italian organizations. Um, here's Anna Gorino, who married and became Anna Grignani at 103 years old at the Columbus um, uh, celebration, Columbus Day celebration in 2014. Um, uh, so um, that gives you a sense of, of her sense of, of personal pride and being involved in those um, celebrations. Uh, so while um, for Italian Americans who over the course of the 20th century, really by, um, by the 1960s, most of the ethnic um, uh, discrimination and prejudices against Italian Americans had waned. Um, Italians were kind of embraced as um, uh, as white Americans. They were no longer considered, you know, a separate um, uh, a separate group. Um, uh, so while American, excuse me, Italian Americans were gaining acceptance, um, we start to see uh, the rise of. Um, indigenous activism um, calling for a reconsideration of Columbus's legacy and calling for an acknowledgement of the centuries and centuries of oppression, of dispossession of their lands, of decimation of their peoples, um, uh, including a reconsideration of the Columbus legacy. Columbus emerged as a, for, um, uh, these activists as a symbol of the beginning of that kind of devastation of indigenous communities. Um, beginning, like I said, in the 1970s, um, there was new scholarship um, that started to look at the Columbus legacy in a more critical light in terms of its devastating impact on indigenous peoples and not purely a kind of heroic story. Um, and to use that phrase I used earlier, Columbus really became seen as a, uh, among many, as a despoiler rather than a discoverer. 
um, that fight for um, indigenous rights and, and acknowledgement of um, the uh, uh, oppression and devastation suffered by indigenous communities. We see that in recent activism um, uh, from just a few years ago, for example, the uh, longstanding protests against the rooting of the Dakota Access Pipeline through um, sacred lands uh, in the Dakotas. Um, we also see closer to home um, uh, activism um, of the Monacan Indian Nation to save their um, historic homeland, Rasawik, um, from a water pump um, uh, uh, activism that just culminated this past summer in a success and a win for um, the Monacan people as that pumping station, um, uh, its original location was, was scrapped. It's, I think, moving elsewhere. Um, so um, in this uh, kind of more um, critical uh, uh, examination of Columbus's legacy and its impact, particularly on um, indigenous peoples of the America, we start to see a changing approach to, um, to Columbus, uh, perhaps um, uh, most symbolically um, or one of, one of the symbolic ways in which we see that new approach is the um, uh, changing celebration of the second Monday in October from what traditionally had been Columbus Day to now what is recognized and celebrated by many as Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, here in Richmond, Mayor LeVar Stoney declared that such in 2019. Um, Virginia did so in 2020, and you can see a map from 2021, not fully up to date of many other states. Uh, who have similarly done so. And also, um, maybe most emphatically, in um, the removal of Columbus monuments, not just here in Richmond, but across the nation. Across the nation, um, uh, there were about 150 Columbus monuments. About 30 of those, a uh, little more than 30 of those have been removed in the past few years. So it gives you a sense of the, the shifting uh, legacy of Columbus. Um, so um, with this new um, artifact in uh, Virginia, in the VMHC's collection, this flag that was used in the um, uh, erection of Richmond's Columbus Monument in 1927, the VMHC can now help tell this broader history, not just of the evolving attitudes and appreciation for Columbus over the centuries, the uh, role Columbus played um, in American history, um, not just from early moments of European exploration, but um, as an important symbol during uh, our nation's fight for independence and establishing its own pantheon of heroes and pantheon of American symbols, um, but also um, uh, taking it through America's kind of fraught history with immigration and anti-immigrant -immig sentiments. Um, a lot of those stories are, are embodied in this flag here, this American flag that uh, was part of the installation of a monument by a group that faced ethnic discrimination and ethnic um, prejudice at the same statue that was recently removed by other community groups who saw that as a symbol of oppression and discrimination against them. So very complex, uh, but I think important and very interesting historical stories. Um, so those are the end of my remarks. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and I know Elizabeth is going to help moderate. So go ahead and put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I'm yes, thank you so much, Karen. I think there's there's so much to unpack with Columbus, sort of the band, the myth, the legend, almost. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. You had what Columbus did in his life, and then you have everything that has happened with Columbus that he had nothing to do with yeah. um, since yeah. then. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Of course, uh, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A or to the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, the first question, Karen, was, um, was anything placed in the space where Columbus was in Bird Park, or is it now vacant? 
Um, it's now vacant, uh, as best I know. If anyone has heard uh, late breaking news or knows more about this than I do, it's vacant. And my understanding is the city is um, similar with uh, the removed Confederate memorials. The city is still kind of figuring out what to do um, with the monuments. Um, so I don't know what the ultimate fate of the Columbus statue is going to be. Uh, that, to the best of my knowledge, remains to be seen. And I can confirm I, I drove past it um, to get into Bird Park on Saturday. So the the pedestal is still there and the, the word Columbus is still in the pedestal. It's been cleaned. So Karen showed the photo of um, when the uh, protesters took down the statue and it was covered in paint. It's now been cleaned, but it's just the pedestal inside the, um, I forget what that, like, a, is it a traffic circle? Um, yeah. So the, the pedestal is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another question here, have there been any efforts to expunge the name of Columbus from towns and cities? What about from uh, Washington, D.C., which is the District of Columbia? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. And while I'm sure there have been um, some calls for that, uh, to my knowledge, let me just kind of <laughs> scan through the old um, memory Rolodex there. To my knowledge, uh, that has not yet happened um, uh, in any you know cities or towns. Columbia University hasn't changed its name. Um, uh, the many towns and cities across the nation haven't changed their names. So um, you know, I think for many people, um, Columbus still exists as this kind of historic figure of legend. They don't um, necessarily associate Columbus with the, um, uh, you know, the kind of violent oppression of the Taino and Arawak and other indigenous Caribbeans, even though he himself was was part of that. And uh, I didn't get into this um, out of a, an interest in time. Um, part of the reason for the changing legacy um, uh, of Columbus in more recent times is because there has been newer scholarship, um, the discovery of archives that showcases that Columbus wasn't just this kind of visionary explorer who um, helped prove that the world was flat, who helped you know find um, uh, for Europeans um, uh, new continents. Um, he was also actively involved in um, you know dictating the the laws and um, the rules that. Uh, led to the death and enslavement of the indigenous peoples while he was governor of um, of the Caribbean under you know working under the Spanish crown. So there's been new scholarship that has changed people's attitudes about Columbus, but um, I don't feel that that has um, has maybe become pervasive enough to completely change um, his status as a as an American hero. Um, who knows in time, maybe other towns will, will reconsider that and change their names and, and we'll see um, more changes like that. But to my knowledge, um, there have not been any towns or cities who've yet changed their names. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then we do have a, a comment here from one of our um, attendees today that says the Italian American Cultural Association and the Giuseppe Verdi Lodge, Order of Sons and Daughters in America, are working to get the statue back to the Italian community from the city of Richmond. So um, yeah, I think it's like Karen was saying, it's an ongoing question of what's gonna happen with the statue now. So I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more of that in yeah, yeah. the upcoming months. Um, yeah. Um, and then we do have, Another question here about, um, are there any plans to remove the painting landing of Columbus from the US Capitol Rotunda? Um, and then there was a comment that I assume that not much can be done about the doors. So you, you have that large yeah. photo um, mm -hmm. picture and then you also have the photo of the doors. Yeah, again, that's an instance where there may be a, a few voices calling for that, but there's not enough um, 
not enough. <laughs> they're not loud enough. They're not numerous enough to lead to any changes. So um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there, there are no plans to remove those monumental pieces of art um, from the U.S. Capitol. I think it's really interesting um, if you think about that those works and um, look to the period in which they were being installed as part of the decoration program for the U.S. Capitol. Those bronze doors are meant to evoke the, the Renaissance masterpiece of Lorenzo Ghiberti's bronze doors showcasing the life of Christ in Florence the, uh, at the um, baptistry, which is part of the Duomo, the main cathedral in Florence. Um, and so here are, you know, American artists and American institutions um, uh, evoking those great masterpieces of Renaissance, of, of Western culture in decorating their own Capitol building. It gives you a sense of the, you know, the aspirations of Americans in, in using art in that way and um, also showcases the, you know, the importance that Columbus uh, had as, as a national hero at that time. Right. Um, well, we do have a couple more minutes here if there's uh, time for you to add a uh, question to the Q&A or to the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Karen, there, there was a question here for, um, so you mentioned Columbus as um, sort of a, like a symbolic figure for early America. And then in the um, cartoons that you showed, you have then Uncle Sam becomes mm -hmm. uh, a figure symbol for America. Um, when did Uncle Sam become a figure? Um, he, uh, he appeared earlier, but he kind of became a dominant symbol for the U.S. in the mid 19th century and beyond. And in part, like, um, I haven't done a ton of research on this topic, but I think in part from, from my uh, limited research on the iconography, the imagery of Uncle Sam, one of the reasons he was adopted is because, you know, America was trying to, the United States, which was still a relatively young country, was trying to assert a um, stronger position on the international stage. And one reason to do so was to have, you know, a masculine personification because of, you know, the associations of masculinity with toughness and strength and virility and so forth. So um, having Uncle Sam as a personification um, uh, helped to do that. He also emerged, uh, I think he originally emerged as a counterpoint to a male British personification while Britannia was a longstanding um, a female personification of Britain, um, I think around 1800, no, even earlier. Um, Britain also had a male counterpart called John Bull. Um, I don't know the full history of John Bull and, and his significance. If anyone else does, they're welcome to share. Um, but um, if America wanted to kind of compete with Britain in terms of its national personifications. You know, Columbia was the equivalent to Britannia and Uncle Sam started to emerge as the counterpoint to John Bull. Um, uh, you know, the Columbia type figure, even though she wasn't always called Columbia, you'll see her called, you'll see her depicted as Liberty or just called America. Um, I think the, you know, the most um, emphatic uh, and iconic and probably well-recognized iteration of that female American personification is the Statue of Liberty um, mm -hmm. installed in New York Harbor in the late 1880s. Um, and so, you know, that female personification still had um, currency, um, uh, widespread currency in the late 19th century period, but that was also a period in which we start to see a more kind of active um, masculine personification in the form of Uncle Sam. Um, also become prominent. That's that's interesting. I haven't heard of John Bull. I have to do some research research on that. Um, and we do have a, a final comment here from uh, one of our attendees, Virginia. She says, "My father and his brother, who were at the time the statue was dedicated, just immigrated from Sicily, were so proud of Columbus and wanted the city to have the statue to show their appreciation for being in the U.S." So yeah. Yeah. again, that speaks to the complex and multifaceted um, 
history of Columbus in our country mm-hmm. from a couple hundred years ago to um, this past century to even today. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you all for attending. And thank you so much, Karen, for your um, presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and for our members, thank you so much for um, coming today to this program. Um, oh, Karen. Yes. Well, I have one more thing before we close, yes. Elizabeth, um, uh, about the American flag that uh, we, we recently acquired through the generosity of the um, Grignani family. Um, you all got a kind of sneak peek of it today. You probably won't see it in our galleries until 2026. I know that sounds like a long time away, but um, uh, we're working on an exhibition on immigration and we wanna include this story and this flag in that exhibition. And because it's a textile light sensitive, we have to limit its exposure to light, its exhibition time. So we'll probably be saving it till 2026 for that exhibition. <laughs> yes, thanks for that. Um, I know I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, for our members, our next curator conversation will be in December. So um, keep your calendars open for that. It will be on December 5th and it will be, uh, all of our curators will be involved and it will be a year in review of new acquisitions. So each of our curators will pick something that has been acquired and uh, talk about why it is um, of interest to the curator and also to the museum. And of course, a full list of all of our events are on our website. I will highlight two upcoming events. Our member only Hazel and Fulton Chauncey lecture is upcoming on Wednesday, October 19th. There are still um, spaces available for members to register. Uh, Gary Gallagher will be speaking about the Other Valley campaign um, and it should be a very um, interesting lecture followed of course by a reception for our members. And um, finally, we do have a um, Virginia House open house on um, Sunday, October 30th. That is for any and all to come and tour Virginia House. If you haven't been inside Virginia House, our historic property in a while, or if it's one of your favorites, mark your calendars and it will be from noon to 4 p.m. on Sunday, October 30th. You don't need to register ahead of time. You just come and enjoy. Um, should be a, a beautiful time to see the house in the fall. Again, thank you so much to Karen and to Haley Fenner, who is our uh, Zoom tech guru. Of course, we couldn't do this without her. And again, thank you so much to all of you, our members, for your continued support. And I look forward to seeing you at the next program. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>